This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about Umberto D. from 1952, directed by Vittorio De Sica. The synopsis of the film from Letterboxd, RJ. Mm -hmm. When elderly pensioner Umberto D'Amico Ferrari returns to his boarding house from a protest calling for a hike in old age pensions, his landlady demands her 15,000 lira rent by the end of the month or he and his small dog will be turned out onto the street. Mm. Unable to get the money in time, Umberto fakes illness to get sent to a hospital, giving his beloved dog to the landlady's pregnant and abandoned maid for temporary safekeeping. That's, like, pretty accurate for, like, the first third of this movie. Ah, uh, first but half. First half? Yeah. But... The it doesn't I mean, really it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. It doesn't get to the no. yeah, to the the issues of it. I mean, the issues about leaving the dog to the uh pregnant housemaid and like all that stuff. That's not really what this movie is like. It's not a main thing, you know. It no, happens. It happens. So I mean, the, the synopsis isn't wrong, but I think they're focusing on yep. the wrong details. Yeah. That's what you that's what you get for what we're paying, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. So, yeah. So this movie this is another one of those movies, RJ, that I am oh. fully aware that if I was watching the 2019 equivalent Oscar Dross <laughs> feel-good movie about mm -hmm. an old pensioner who is bummed out by the failure of institutions to do well by him and other mm -hmm. uh, people, uh, and his incredibly adorable and loyal little dog, I would be avoiding this movie like the plague and would not be considering it one of the better films of the Criterion Collection. So... Umberto D. This is a movie that I watched for the first time three years ago. Actually, in, mm -hmm. the, in the time that we were probably even recording the Criterion Crews podcast, because I just wanted to watch this movie. Yeah. And I wasn't concerned about, I mean, we could have recorded for six episodes and uh, never gotten around to it, but here we yeah. are. Here we are. I remember that time, because uh, you were talking about it when we were, this is behind the scenery, when we were talking about starting the podcast, you're like, one day you would have to watch Umberto D., and I was like, is that good? And you're like, you'll see when you get there. And I was like, ha, huh, we'll never get to 201. <laughs> but uh, here we are, right? Yeah, and here we are. I got him again. Here we are. Oh, well. Oh, well. So this movie, it falls into that uh, that strain of film, the, the neo Italian neorealism. That was uh, all the craze. Uh, Jessica also makes that movie, The Bicycle Thief, uh, Thieves, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. this is kind of uh, one of those big representatives of that particular movement. I think we've seen a couple off the top of my head. I can't think of any. That's okay. There's, there's, there's those transitions with uh, Fellini. That's always mm -hmm. in the reference to it because Fellini kind of goes completely in a different direction from this sort of filmmaking that Italy yeah. was really focusing on at the time. Mm -hmm. Or at least the filmmakers were focusing on. Uh, yeah, this movie opens up with uh, a bunch of old men gathering around and protesting the government that's doing them wrong, <laughs> which uh, was very, like, apropos because here in uh, Creepsville, in this neck of the woods, it feels like we're getting close to something similar going on. I mean, the bigger comment would be, has it ever gone away? Have things ever changed? Yeah. it's It goes in... Cycles? It ebbs and flows, you know? Yes. There's these moments. So watching this, like, and I, watching this again, I actually mm -hmm. was surprised how much of it I had already forgotten. Like, kind mm -hmm. of like the in-between stuff. And the movie just felt very different this time out. But my, uh, I still enjoyed it all the same. So yeah, the movie opens up with uh, old uh, Umberto and a bunch of other old men. And uh, they're just demanding that the minister uh, just increase those pensions. We need money. We need to be able to mm -hmm. live. And what do they do? Well, you don't have a permit to protest. So here come the cops. Start running, old fucks. And uh, yep. there, there come the fucking cops rolling all around and on their vehicles and chasing, you know, 60-year-old men through the streets <laughs> who are, like, ducking down, uh, like, alleyways and their dog dogs barking at him it's like shut that dog up they'll find us it's <sighs> it's just like oh what a what a great way to kick this movie off you know yeah and then you know what the real kicker is is these guys are like wow oh, well whatever i don't really need it anyways they're like i'm doing pretty good but in border d is just like i really needed this i, I need to pay off my debts and it's like oh, i've got my debts yeah. paid off it's all great mm -hmm. and then you're like oh no umberto, umberto. what's gonna happen buddy so 
you know, he's going to the, I guess basically the food kitchen. The uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, he's but he's got his dog, his his flake. Uh, oh, flake. He's, flake's under the table. Oh, he's man. feeding him his scraps, giving mm-hmm. taking, taking, uh, trying to run the swindle of uh, not making sure nobody knows that he's feeding his dog because apparently people hate dogs in this universe, or at least are very indifferent to this fucking mm. lovely dog. Oh yeah, indifferent to the to the point of being. I don't know, man. Like, who who would have a problem with this dog? You know, there is like, who cares if he's gonna eat some like old ass broth and like a piece of bread? What does it matter? Where's the, give him some gabagool? You know, give him a little gabagool. It's gonna be good for him. So Umberto heads back to uh, his room that he's been living yes. in forever and ever, mm-hmm. and uh, he finds uh, these people just making out in there, and he's like, "What the fuck? What's going on here?" Well, his landlady. She's a real, real peach. Teaches, mm-hmm. uh, has a bunch of opera parties going on. She's trying to socially climb in life. And, uh, yeah, she's just renting it out while he's not around. And, uh, there's not much he can do about it. He's behind on the rent and she's going to kick him out because she's got plans for this house and mm-hmm. does not care what happens to this guy. And, uh, mm-hmm. across the hall, there's, uh, the, the lovely, uh, Maria. She's the maid to this, uh, estate house. And, she is dealing with ants, burning ants up, <laughs> setting them on mm-hmm. fire constantly, trying to wash them away with water. But the ants just keep coming. This place is a dump. Uh, it doesn't mm-hmm. look it doesn't look that bad. Um, it definitely doesn't feel like a real dump. Uh, like it's, it's not shot like on a location that really feels lived in. But we're told enough, and it feels like well, you know what? It's a dump, but it's my dump. It's my home. It's where I mm-hmm. live. Where else am I supposed to go? I can I can make this work. I've lived here my whole life. My like I have all these memories. This is what I, I want to keep this place. So you know he starts selling watches and books, but he's just trying to raise that money. That uh, fifteen thousand liar lire liar something like that. Whatever Italian bucks. Fun, yeah, fun Italian bucks. bucks. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, he's trying to do this, uh, keep it legit. He's got some pride to him still. He doesn't, he's not mm-hmm. a bum. And the landlady's like, nope, it's gotta be all or nothing. No, no half measures. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in this Maria mentions, oh, Hey, I'm pregnant. I don't even know who it is, whose baby <laughs> it is. Cause I've uh, been seeing these two soldiers, one from Naples, one sure. from Florence does not know, doesn't know what he's going to do. And I find that, uh, that stuff is actually handled pretty well for the mm-hmm. era because Umberto, he could have been more of a jerk about this, but he seems like he's been around and he realizes life's complicated. And this isn't the first time this has ever happened in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, shit happens, man. I mean, I got lovers all, all across the country, but mm-hmm. uh, who knows where, where they go at night. No. Stuff's complicated. Stuff's complicated. So Umberto, yeah. he's, he starts scheming. He's trying to plot, trying to figure out a way to make this work. Um, mm-hmm. He even decides to start playing sick. You know, he starts, uh, he's, he's getting, he's coming down with something. He's getting that thermometer in the armpit going. Uh, Mm -hmm. and so he's able to call the ambulance, but he's also worried about his dog, Flake, you know, he's like, well, Mm -hmm. I gotta make sure if like, at this point, Flake's like just around, he's loyal. He's always by side. He's going for walks, all those wonderful little things. He, he gets put into the, um, I guess the church hospital, being tended on by the mm-hmm. nuns and mm-hmm. being he's like he's not working the system too much but he's got to get that free room and board free meals because that's the world that we live in yes <laughs> he's got to be the only place he can be taken mm-hmm. care of is uh hospitals or jail he never thinks about that though in the movie he never thinks about going to jail and uh but i guess he loses his dog anyway so and, and, and again say, yeah, he... pride he's got his pride mm-hmm. yeah. well there's a lot of things that come into play here i mean you know what about Flake, man? Oh, like, I mean, yeah. in the church hospital, at least he's only there for a couple of days. He can go back and get him. But that's right. Anywhere else. And so uh-uh. he returns to his apartment and there's just these workmen tearing the place up, tearing off the, mm-hmm. uh, the drywall, drywall, the uh, uh, <laughs> other thing on the walls. <laughs> yeah, whatever that Flo- is. It's floral, not- floral print, the uh, wallpaper. There we go. Words. Well, one, yeah, one of them's wallpaper, and then the other one, he's like really screeching it, and you're like, "What's he doing?" Scraping away, because because yeah. uh, the the landlady, she has met a man of class and character who owns a movie theater, and so she now she can get to 
Was that explicitly made clear? There is a bit I knew where... that he was in the money. Yeah. No, there, but... he, I believe there is a call, there is a joke that like he owns a theater and now she can hit like free she can go to see free movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. For some reason I thought she she was said something like I just get free stuff now and I was like, what a greedy bitch. Wow. Antonio <laughs> Belloni is Belloni is her name. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she's fine, but she's kind of mean to the old man, so I don't feel bad oh, uh, yeah. saying that kind of stuff. No, she's you know? terrible. He even, yeah, she he, sucks. Yeah. So he's there, and he's like, where the hell's my dog? Mm-hmm. Well, the, do- the door kept getting opened and closed. Oh, the dog, too, and Fleek. <sighs> when uh, the ambulance comes, and he's like, oh, he gets the ambulance, well, the, the one ambulance uh, man to kind of play with the dog, so the dog's distracted, mm-hmm. so he doesn't see him leave. Mm-hmm. It's real. Str- struggle is real. Oh, yeah. So now... Now uh, Umberto's got a mission. He's got he's mm-hmm. he's a pensioner. He's got a lot of free time on his hands. He just has no money to you know eat and live. But he's got mm-hmm. enough. He's got to find his dog. And he goes looking. He can't find the dog anywhere. He sees some interactions between uh, Maria and some of her uh, her suspected fathers of her baby. Uh, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like not going well. It's not going well as you'd expect. Mm-hmm. So eventually, Umberto goes to the city pound. Oh boy! Uh, I'd like you to describe what happens in that scene. So here. it's kind of like it's like a concentration camp, but for dogs. Yes, and, and, and this happens all around the world. There's a yes. There's an episode of a Louis Theroux documentaries where it is about like uh, the Los Angeles city pound. Not not fun, not a good time. Very sad. People just don't. People are horrible. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. So there's just these dogs, and uh, you know he's walking around, and it's kind of like in that downtime. And he looks over into this one kind of uh, storage area, and he's like, "Is this where the dogs get put down?" And there's a guy who just kind of solemnly nods, "Yep." Uh, yeah. And he kind of like it's kind of like hard to figure out what you're looking at, like how this operates. You just see these like uh-huh. these these bins. <laughs> And it's like, huh, uh, that's uh, interesting. And so he's looking around. There's a lot of, like, hecticness. He's being brought around to the cages, looking at all these dogs, rows upon rows of dogs barking excitedly. They want out of the cage. And mm-hmm. then there's and then there's mm-hmm. always more trucks pulling up. There's always more trucks pulling up, and these dogs being yanked out of the thing, brought into their cages just for their little few, you know, those few days before there's no more room. There's no more room for the mm-hmm. dogs. So where do the dogs go? Well, RJ, they get put into... Uh, kind of like a bin, you know, they get wheeled, they get wheeled along in their mm-hmm. cage. And, you know, Umberto's looking at this cage trying to see, oh, is that flight in there? It kind of looks like flight, but I can't really tell. And then he gets brought into that room that we saw earlier. And then they get shoved into the oven. And then the dogs mm-hmm. are like look, mm-hmm. looking real happy. And then the door closes and then it cuts away. And uh, the rest is left to your imagination of what happens next. Mm-hmm. So, Mm. Fortunately for all of us, mm-hmm. uh, another truck pulls up, and a bunch of dogs are being yanked out. <laughs> and uh, one of them <laughs> is Flake, and he immediately jumps. Oh my God, it's Flake! Oh, he grabs him. Flake's like licking his face, and we get the cover of the the DVD Blu-ray uh, mm-hmm. of, of them embracing. And it's like, yay! There's like still some good things in this world. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, it's that's one takeaway from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it does it reinstores hope for a, a little bit for a little bit. So old uh old Umberto, he, he's got mm-hmm. he's got his dog back, but he's got no money. He's got no solution to this uh problem of being homeless. So he solemnly grabs his bag, packs his stuff. He's looking down at the window to the cobblestone. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's thinking, he's thinking real hard about shortcuts <laughs> to uh yeah. his problem. <laughs> And yeah. uh, he kind of leaves in the middle of the night. The maid hears him leaving, and she kind of, she doesn't know exactly what's going on. But I think by the end of their conversation, she's kind of like, oh, he's leaving. And he's like, yeah, I'll be living nearby. When will I see you next? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Being very vague. I don't and know. You, whatever my stuff is in there, you can just have. I don't need it anymore. <laughs> so yep. like, yeah, I found a new place. It's, uh, it's cheaper. It's real close <laughs> by. It'll be great. So, obviously, Umberto has resolved, well, life's not worth living anymore. And he mm-hmm. goes on his way. He, uh, he, But he's got this dog. He's got Flake. He cares about Flake. Mm-hmm. So, he goes to a, 
a boarding house of sorts and that's that's being generous yeah oh sorry it, you know I what thought, I thought I'm, it was I, I kind of, i've house. kind of skipped i've skipped a bit here though because there's the whole bit where he's uh he was trying to get money together he see and he sees old colleagues a little bit. He, he, mm-hmm. he, he goes to find some friends that still have work and he tries to explain what their problem is but people yeah. are, people are busy they, they don't mm-hmm. want to listen to what's going on with your life. The fact that you have no money, because they probably have just enough money for themselves. But maybe that's yeah. even too much money in the grand scheme of things. And mm-hmm. uh, it's just not working out. And he's got his, but he's got his pride. He doesn't want to tell people how bad it really is. And he doesn't want to like mm-hmm. overstep his bounds. And uh, he's being sad. And he start, he sees this panhandler. He sees this panhandler asking for money. It's, it's just making up lies, saying, I've got seven I've got seven people back home I'm looking for. Oh, I've got two kids. He goes, goes back and forth, yelling at people, abrasively uh, making people feel bad for not giving him a coin. And Umberto just doesn't want to do this. And uh, But eventually he's like, oh, I think I've got to. And he starts like, you know, thinking about like just putting his hand out, putting his hand out by people, not even saying anything, just being so fucking sad. And this one guy walks by and he's about to take some money out. But Umberto's pride... And not wanting to be shamed, he starts like, "Oh no, I'm just like, you know, feeling the sun on my hand on both sides, and uh, I can't do it. He just can't do it." And then he kind mm-hmm. of uh, he has a scheme where he uh, gives Flake Flake his hat, and the Flake just kind of stands up on his hind legs with a little hat to gather money, mm-hmm. and, he, and he goes and hides behind a pillar, and it's mm-hmm. oh, RJ, it'll break your heart. And uh, I know, and uh, and then uh, and then someone he knows, a magistrate or something like that, comes along. He's like, "Oh no, oh, oh Flake just likes to play. <laughs> I'm not. I'm everything's good. Everything. Let's go for a coffee. Let, let's go for that gabagool." And um, <laughs> so they have a coffee. They depart on their separate ways, and he's still left. And so now we're back to him looking out at those cobblestone roads from his second story. And, uh, yeah, he's trying to find a place for his dog, takes him to, uh, the boarding house and realizes this is no, this is not the life for my dog. I can't in good conscience leave my dog here because apparently once the money runs out, they just kick your dog out. Even though who knows, who knows what things these people are claiming, the accuracy of it all. I I like the suspicion where he's like, the dogs are very happy here. We have a boy. He trains them. They're all very happy. And it just keeps cutting to the one aggressive dog. And uh, old Umberto's like, okay, tell me more. He's like, everything's good. Dogs are good. Dog's fine. No yeah. no problem. Money. Dog fine. And then he'll look at the mean dog and he'll be like, oh. he's like, wait a minute. And Fl- These dogs aren't trained at all. And Flake he's like, cowers behind him. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's not what you want. No. It's not what you want, Jared. So he no. uh, he leaves there. He's just like, no, can't do it. And they're like, well, thanks for wasting my fucking time, bud. That's a that's an Italian. That's a quote. Yeah, he he does he does say that. He's like we said uh less talk more money. Oh. And then he goes to the park. And What does he do at the park, Jer? He, he tries to give that little dog t- uh, to a little girl. And uh He that, does. That that little girl's nanny's like fuck off. I this is stupid. We don't I, I'll be cleaning up dog shit all the time. I don't want this goddamn dog. And so You're real selfish. Yeah. So that, that doesn't work. So Flake, he goes to play with some kids in the park and Umberto tries to slip away thinking, well, this is easier. This is the only way to do it. And he goes and like goes across the little bridge and he goes and hides in the bushes and Flake just comes right to him because he's a dog and he can smell. He's not blind. And he finds him and it's like, Oh my God, I can't get rid of this dog. And then Umberto makes a, a, a dramatic decision. He can't get rid of this dog. He doesn't want to go on living. So I guess it's we, they're both going out. So Umberto takes Flake up in his arms. He walks over to these railroad tracks that have been kind of running on the background around this park. And uh, yes. he stands right by the train tracks and he's looking down this, this train that's barreling down. Flake figures out what's going on and starts uh-huh. fighting the very, uh, very uh, legitimately dog, like animal fighting to get out of a, uh, a desperate a grasp, grasp and uh, fights out of it, fights out of it. And uh, Umberto is of course like, Oh God. And it's kind of realizes that Umberto, uh, the dogs run away and uh, uh-huh. fled. Umberto runs after the dog. Flake is uh, wary 
of uh, Umberto and does not is making him like giving him the the gears. You know, it's like you cold shoulder. You just try to fucking kill me, you son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. What what was that? Why I'm I'm so scared? Why did you do this? And Umberto is just like, oh god. It's like come back, come back. Here's a pine cone. Come back. Come on. Let's hang out. He goes and hides behind a tree. And he's like, come on, coaxing him out, doing all the sweet things. Like, come on, buddy. Come on, little buddy. Mm-hmm. Eventually, eventually, Flight comes around. And uh, they start playing together. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they're, they're still homeless. Mm-hmm. Um, but, they're, but they're together, Jared. But they're together as they, they play down the park boulevard together. And the film r- comes up with, fine. <laughs> And it's like, oh, so this movie, it's like, I, it makes me sad, RJ. I cry when I watch this movie. It's, it's so mm-hmm. fucking sad because it's like nothing solved. <laughs> like nothing, 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 nothing saved, nothing solved. <laughs> the problems still remain. And we got this little fucking dog, this wonderful little dog and this old man. So, and anyway, so yeah, I, 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 I think this movie's amazing. I love it. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it manipulates me so well, <laughs> unquestionably. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, it was great to rewatch it. I'm, uh, I'm not looking forward to, uh, we've got some more like sad old people movies coming up soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like, oh no, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, so one thing is I think that you could interpret the ending in a few different ways. And it could be a glass half full or half empty type deal. Yep. But what else do you have to say about Umberto D? That that's uh, I mean I talked quite a bit. That's I mean your, I, I, did, I, did, I did I did a whole recap kind of. You mentioning did do a the, whole recap. Doing uh, all the things I like about this movie as like my uh, uh-huh. the fact I don't usually do this for any old movie because they don't really leave me with a lot sure. of feeling about them one way or another. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, I I think this movie is really good, and I'm curious, RJ, with all mm-hmm. this this dog tension. And, uh, mm. But it's also dog love, and yes. uh, I'm curious, RJ, what you thought with your uh, first time watch of Umberto D. I can see why you're curious because I think if I asked, I, I you know sometimes I'm like, hey, Jared, what do you think I thought of this movie? And sometimes you're like, I don't know, or sometimes you're like, tough to say because it's got some stuff you'll like and stuff you you won't like, and that's a fair assessment of this. Uh, it's got some stuff I like and some stuff I don't like. So. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I've ever made aware on this podcast before, but uh, the animal stuff in movies, uh, I'm. It depends on the portrayal, but I'm usually against it, unless it is in the endearing and loving sense. Uh, and the thing about Umberto D is that this is in the endearing and loving sense. Uh, this movie, Jer, is just a major bummer, dude. <laughs> like, I I was <laughs> I was watching it, and I was just kind of like, I think I started sitting, and I just. As it went on, I just kind of sunk into the couch a little bit more and a little bit more. And eventually, I was kind of just lying down, like, and it was an, a, a physical rea- response to an emotional reaction. I was just like, "Oh man, this old guy, this dog, Flake." I, I felt worse for Flake than I did the old man, but that's because I'm heartless, or I'm only, I only care about <laughs> yeah. the animals. I don't, I don't give a shit about people, but I, I did feel for the old dude. So, um, yes, it it is a very good movie. There are some scenes that are extremely difficult to watch, I think. Like, the pound visit is – it's tough to watch. But uh, I'm going to get some heat for this probably, but I'm going to compare it to Night and Fog. (laughs) And I I know people are going to be like, hey, you can't trivialize – uh, things that happen to real people. And I'll be like, hey, you know what? This shit's happening every, every day, day all over the world still to this day. So it's like maybe you shouldn't trivialize the life of another living thing compared to the life of a human. That's my hard stance. I'm taking it. Uh, but yeah, that stuff was pretty difficult for me to watch because I was just like, ah. like. And the thing is, I know that that's what it's like. I know mm-hmm. that. It wasn't like a lot of the times the problems I have in movies are where it's like unnecessarily like shoehorned in there or it's like abusive and it doesn't need to be. It's like, I don't like that. But this movie, this movie is genuinely, genuinely about the relationship between a guy and his dog. And it is like the scene has actual weight and importance to the story. So 
I can get by it with that. All that said, was I was I looking at the ceiling during these scenes? Yeah, because I was like, I don't want to watch this right now. Like this stuff bums me out. Like on days where I'm not even watching it, where I'm just kind of like thinking about all of the animals, all the all the kitties and the doggos, and they're just in their <laughs> cages. And it's like that stuff bums me out so much. Oh man! So uh, th- this one uh, when I went to pick up Warlock. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i still think about that experience of all these like little animals and cages mm. Mm. not good so like our two cats one we got from a farm and it was uh like it was andrew's uncle's farm and it was because all the other cats were killed by a dog so it was like it wasn't one of those deals where people are like hey adopt don't shop it's like well we didn't you know we we took her because she would have been dead uh but the, with winnie it was kind of a weird experience too because we got her from the shelter but um there was like a, a thing that went through there and all the cats were ill. So they like put down all the cats. And when we went to get her, there was only two cats in the in the shelter. So it was like really strange because like all the cages were empty, but not for the reason you would hope that they all got adopted. And you're just like, oh, no. Well, I guess a lot of them go over to that last chance cat ranch. Yeah, to, our to local in Creepsville, we have a local like uh, no kill like savior place, which is good. But uh, that place is getting worn a little thin. Yeah. Anyways, the reason I brought it up was uh, that scene is real tough to watch. And uh, I, I'm i going to go so far as to say that um, I think this movie is good. The first half of it, I wasn't as super invested in it until the story went to the end and it became about uh, Umberto D and Flake. Mm-hmm. That's where this. That's where the this. It actually kind of got me, because I, I re, that was one of the things I really got where um, it spoke to me, Jared. It really touched me, mm-hmm. because uh, I saw a uh, a funny little tweet going around the other day, Jared, mm-hmm. about uh, people that were like, or it was like a meme or something. It was like something about how you want to want to commit suicide, but you don't because your your pet would be sad that you were gone, and I was like, what a what a relatable thing <laughs> because there's a I think I've mentioned in the last couple months or, you know, in the in the entirety of the show, it's like, what is this thing that we do in this world? Why do we do it? Why does any of it matter? And then it's like, oh, wait, we can. Uh, there's kitties and puppies out there and they need a nice home, Jer. And it's like, I, I wouldn't want to leave either because then my cat would be like, what the fuck? Where did he go? He just left us. What an asshole. And I don't want to seem like an asshole to my pets, so that's why I'm not. That's why I'm not checking out. Uh, so I found it extremely relatable, but also it's. So when you said the ending is kind of a bummer because nothing's changed, I I will go in the opposite route and I'll say I think the ending is kind of optimistic because the way I saw it, right. my yeah. own my own personal bias I brought to it, I was like, look. The relationship between man and dog is so strong so that it changed. Need... It, it it changed him, man. It changed him to uh, want to live again. And then they were they were they were buddies again. It took a little bit of convincing, but they were buddies again. So I was like, you know what? It's not it's not necessarily the ending. Maybe I wanted, but I think it's the best one we could have got. I don't know what I would have wanted. I wouldn't have wanted any. Uh, what I would have wanted is maybe Umberto finds a lottery ticket and he's like, mm-hmm. oh boy. And then he buys the dog shelter and then all the, him and the dogs all eat spaghetti every night together. And it's just like real fun and stuff. That's probably the ending I would have that's, wanted. That's, but the, I don't that's, know. The, that's the good ending. That's the good ending. That's the alternative take yeah. that uh, when you, Vincenzo. When, when, uh, when you beat uh, Umberto D on very hard. On very hard. Yeah, that's the, the alt ending. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the tough stuff to watch is tough, but I mean, you should watch it. People should watch that and they should feel bad and then maybe they won't be bad people. But I mean, preach probably people I, who I, are watching on Birdo D yeah, are exactly. probably not the people going out there and beating dogs anyway. So probably, probably not. That's a preaching to the choir thing, but no, it's, it's very good. It is, uh, it is a major bummer and it, it's tough to watch at sometimes, but I do think there is, there's little, little slivers of optimism thrown out there because you know it's that that connection to to living things man and dogs expect dogs and cats especially dude they're on that other level they tap into different dimensions neil gaiman style i see yeah but yeah it's good it's very good yeah yeah, yeah no, I it's, uh, 
Yeah, it's a movie that uh, on the rewatch, yeah, I was just like, yep, this movie works on me the exact same way now. Because <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, getting very weepy at the end because it's like, oh. <laughs> So that that's like a lot of it is like a man, man, manipulation <laughs> and it's very well done I think. Oh yeah, like there a lot of it too like none of it seems um but it's genuine. Like it's not like yeah, it's not like yeah, a, it's, insincere, it's but sometimes like you watch a movie and you're just like oh that made me feel nothing and this movie was like oh played me like a piano. Well, what was that movie I was talking about? oh green book last week in the creeps when i was talking about i was like yeah it's it's like intentionally manipulative it's like but that's what those movies are this one doesn't feel like that at all it's like you actually believe it's like this dude just loves his dog and these are things he all he's trying to do is set his dog up with a better life because he's checked out he's like fuck this Mm -hmm. i'm over this shit but uh yeah it's tough stuff man tough stuff tough stuff Mm-hmm. You want to hear from some people who aren't fans? Uh, I uh, people who don't like this movie, I I have a hard time believing that it's kind of like what do we, before we even get to it. It's like why are you watching this? Do you know what I mean? Like why why would you just casually turn this thing on and be like, oh yeah, a little Umberto D, let's go for it. Anyways, you tell me about people who hate this fucking thing, Marcus. One okay. star. It seems to be a great sin to dislike this movie, but I just cannot understand the appeal of Umberto D. I never laughed. I never cried. I was never surprised or excited. The movies I want to see deal with exceptional situations, stuff that is worth making movies about. I cannot find anything worth mentioning in this movie. I mean, that's super unfair, I think. Uh... I wonder what their their exceptional films are. You know what I think is weird? They Their bio says, I think reviews depend as much on the movie as they do what you had for breakfast that day. Don't take it too serious and, and enjoy what you feel like enjoying. But at the same time, this guy's reviews like, there is nothing good in this fucking movie. It's like, all right, dude, whatever. Uh, no five-star films, no uh, half-star films. Uh, the highest rated films they have are four, four and a half stars, 12 monkeys. <laughs> the wages of fear, uh-huh. uh, a pure formality or una pura formalita, a silent partner. I don't know what that is. And then one star films, Umberto D, Burning, which is supposed to be good. And then The Illusionist, <laughs> the 2000s, uh-huh. like the Neil Berger film. The... Why is, <laughs> why is, <laughs> why is it? okay. I mean, I watched that movie. I didn't think it was great, but. I, I don't know by any means if it's I, a one I feel star. Like, I, feel, I feel like The Illusionist is like that. That's the first time that movie's been brought up in, in the last in, ten years. Yeah, I think so. Other than in, like, hey, remember that movie that's world? or it's like, hey, remember that movie that's not The Prestige? Oh, you mean The Illusionist? Yeah. Hey, I had both of those movies and I watched them all the time. Not all the time. I watched The Illusionist once. Uh, yeah, nobody's talked about The Illusionist for probably a hundred years. I would say <sighs> probably. Probably. Nightmare Baker, one and a half star, okay. meandering, fake deep, European bullshit. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to Nightmare Baker's. I thought you were going to go to Mazinta's, uh, which was interesting. I It was someone who gave it a, a low rating. The, this, the Mazinta that you didn't mention and the last person both gave the Irishman two stars. Oh. And that person has their personal email in their bio. Huh. So if... Uh, you're interested, but you know, Nightmare Baker, their bio says, you know who I am. I don't. <laughs> uh, I know that they don't have many five star films, uh, but one of them includes Midsommar. Oh, so that'll tell you something there. I mean, the other ones are they're just De Palma movies, De Palma movies and Jackie Brown. Oh. But then Midsommar fits in there for some reason. Fake deep. For whatever reason. Oh, my God. Okay, so this person only has uh, two one-and-a-half-star films. One is Umberto D. Do you know what the other one is based off of a hit Stephen King novel? And I'll give you a hint. The audiobook is recorded by uh, Joe uh, Montagna. Oh, or I mean Mon- Montagna. Oh, crap. I, I can't remember. I remember you mentioning that. I can't remember. Joe Montana was a quarterback, you crazy asshole. Uh, the movie you love, Thinner thinner touching noses and stuff so uh, apparently this person thinks umberto d is on par with uh thinner thinner okay 
Sure. Uh, I got another one here. Two stars from Ellie. Okay. Bored, literally bored out of my mind. Hmm. They also they just gave a heart to Midsummer. Oh. And they say big little lies enthusiast. Uh, that show we got like one episode in, it, and Andrew's like, "This show sucks." So they're like, "All right, no which, problem." Which, which show was that? Big Little Lies. Okay. Which this person has logged on Letterboxd, which is a serialized HBO show. So I don't know if this counts. But, but if it's one and done, it counts. No, it's not. It's 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 in its second oh, season. Well, that's bullshit then. It is bullshit. Because the terror is not on Letterboxd anymore either. Exactly. It is bullshit. This Big Little Lies. And I think they're going to a third season. So <laughs> what are your rules, Letterboxd? Uh, this person gave Big Little Lies five stars and then Parasite whiplash social network nightcrawler so that's a real niche market of uh, films there uh half star films include the fred movie that comes up actually quite a bit i don't always mention it but the fred movie is on a lot of these people's lists and then uh one star films let's see here just friends with ryan reynolds oh my god ma that hit movie that could have been the best movie of the year that we haven't seen yet nope no way that's one star <laughs> Not f- not from you and me, at least. No. Well, that movie we haven't seen yet. Not yet, but I mean, we will. Fred. Which yeah, Fred? Yeah, it was that YouTube kid who the R is backwards, and it was always like, I'm Fred. You know that thing? No. It's called Fred the Movie. Oh, man. I, I don't know. I, I'm not- uh it, you don't need you don't need this in your life, Jared. Just trust me on this. You don't need you don't need it. Well, you don't say, need it in your life. Fred, the movie. Okay. It's a YouTube thing. and Or like a Disney Channel thing. I don't know. It's some shit like that. Lucas Crawshank, huh? Oh, look at that. Half star, half star, one star. Good. Yep. Well, the, and that's what I mean. Like, this thing's popped up a lot of times. I just never thought it was worth mentioning before. But it's like, you know what? A lot of people talk about this Fred movie, which makes me... Be, same question. Why are you watching Umberto D? Why are you watching the Fred movie? <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very clearly for little kids. I, I, I don't know what you're... I don't know. You I got any know. more brain busters? Yeah, I got, I got one more. One more. Okay. This, this is a lengthy one. Okay. Two stars. A rewatch by Francisco Silva. Okay. This is one of those sacred cows that I really can't stand. I like De Sica, really love The Bicycle Thieves and The Garden of the Finzi Contini's, but Umberto D has always struck me as being cheap, sentimental crap. This is for several reasons, but mainly the titular Umberto is not a very likable character. He is deceitful, judgmental, and takes advantage of people when he can. I understand he has not money, but maybe if he wasn't such an irascible bastard, people would be nicer to him. Also, he Mm. tries to kill his dog because he wants to commit suicide, and fuck that. Was this RJ? This film does, for me, represent some of the worst excesses of Italian neorealism, which can at times move from social commentary and attempt at presenting the real life of the downtrodden into sentimental pap. This story of a sad man and his little dog feels exploitative while failing to actually move me. Contextualizing this film in a wider perspective, it came out in the same year as Kurosawa's Ikiru, another film about a depressed old man, which is infinitely better, and even being one whole hour longer feels shorter and more dynamic than this. That's because you truly love Watanabe and want him to be happy, while Umberto is a non-entity. Um... So yeah, Akira is one of those uh, future yeah. sad old man movies in Tokyo I've been Story. Look- yeah, I've been looking forward to that for yeah. both of those. You you really like those movies, right? Yeah, I I, I don't think to I, a point. I don't love Akira as much as other people do, but it's very mm-hmm. good. Yeah, well, I, I've heard you talk about them in some kind of favorable fashion, so mm-hmm. I, I look forward to those. Um, okay, so. First off, I'll address, yeah, you know what? I, I wasn't on board with Umberto trying to kill his dog, too, but I do understand it. He was like, I tried to do good by this dog. He's like, you know what he was doing here? He didn't want his dog to end up getting incinerated in the fucking pound. So he's like, we'll go out together. Is that right? I don't know. What do, What's your stance on euthanasia? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Human and animal. Oh, man. I don't know, man. Do you want to hear about uh, Francisco Silva's stance on five-star movies that are not five stars? Yes, please. Last Jedi, Free Fire. Call me by your name. Free Fire. 
free Ooh, fire. That's that is a uh, oh, that's an out there take because I, I don't know very many people at all who like who that like movie. That like most people are like that. It's Ben Wheatley, right? And yep. no no one likes that movie. Okay, here here's the one thing I'll say though. Uh, this person may stumble upon our podcast if they haven't already because it's tons and tons of criterion movies so they do have good five-star movies but uh here is where i think they 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 strayed from the path because i'm not going to mention the good five-star movies like brigsby bear or (laughs) sacred deer or children of paradise Mm -hmm. things like that so those two movies uh free fire three billboards black panther uh, what do we got here? Death of Stalin, a movie you just talked about. Yep. Um, okay, wait. There was a whole bunch. I'm going back now. Peeping Tom, I don't think it's five stars. Uh, Roma, Hereditary. And then here's a good one for you, Jer. Night of the Hunter, Endgame. And then uh, the big kicker, Midsommar. Because, you know, <laughs> it's just there. It's just there, man. But like lots of criterion things. It's just all the other things that uh, I think at this point just seem just seem typical, right? Yep. One star movies include the two Rob Zombie Halloweens. Yep. Uh, Halloween Resurrection. Two other horror movies. And then Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, which is <laughs> just a, a movie that just gets shit piled on it left and right. It seems like. Yeah. It's boring. It's not terrible. It's boring for sure. Yeah. So anyways, a weird uh, mixed bag of things here. Some good, lots of good movies, but uh, you know, some of those other movies you've been watching, dude, or dudette, wh- wh- whatever you is, whoever you are, I, I should stop while I'm ahead, right? That, that's, that's, that sounds good. Yeah. Get, that's it for the hate. So get, yeah, none of these people, I don't think really rose any issues for me that uh, I would say absolutely. I, that's a good point. This movie sucks. No. I don't know. It's hard. I mean, no, I liked it. It's hard, it's hard for me to be even like super critical about this movie because I had such a strong emotional response to it. Like, And, mm-hmm. I, and I have now twice the same way. And uh, I think that's a uh, speaks to the some film craft, RJ. Oh, are you talking about fine artists in film craft yeah, over there? Because I don't know if yeah, you know. Artisanal cinema. We haven't had artisanal cinema for a while on this podcast. It hasn't been brought up. It hasn't I, come up very I've often. Been, uh, I don't know. If we, we haven't actually even talked about, uh, even during our ghoul schools, uh, about this elevated horror. Oh, fuck. That's such horseshit. Who, who cares? <laughs> uh, such horseshit. Horror is horror. Don't try to like off-brand it into these things to make you feel better that you like it. Elevated horror. It's it's hereditary in midsummer. It's elevated. It's not. God damn! There's, Fucking relax. There, there's a really uh one of my one of my favorite Letterbox reviewers, uh, PD187. Mm-hmm. Um, their review for that movie, The Hole in the Ground, that came out this oh, year. Yeah, it's like, yeah. When when do we get a Wayans parody of this kind of crap called like a hereditary bitch who Babadook it follows in the quiet place last midsummer? And uh, A420 presents elevated horror movie, a New England fuck tale. That's what they are. Oh. We're at that. We're on the cusp of uh. Making fun of that stuff. Elevated horror. Elevated horror. I mean, it's not what I want, Jer. I mean, when it's good, it's good. But now sure. but now everyone's just like, this is the mode that we have to work. When are you going to make your elevated horror film about... <laughs> um... That's that, well, it's, it's It's a podcast I'm working on. Oh, is it? It's kind of a Pygmalion experiment, isn't it? Where you mm-hmm. try to like educate this like gutter Snipe. sluice. And... Wow. <laughs> what is that? Hey, I'm Oof. talking about myself here. Oh, you. <laughs> you know, you know, you, you ever heard? Uh, you ever heard words like that, buddy? Yeah, I have. This is a character I play for the podcast. Yeah. You know. Okay, uh, I should quit while I'm ahead. Yes, sounds good. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, that's what people come for an um, Bro D review to learn about um, about uh, elevated horror. Sure. And how, well, what uh, else how, would you? How, be that's all bullshit. Mm-hmm. After the break, we're going to the dog pound for podcasters. I thought you were going to say we're going to fall in front of a train, but I guess it's not like totally happen. No. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. Nice knowing you, bud. Uh, I'll see you in hell. <laughs> <laughs> 